Hey, what's up guys? Today I'll show you a horror film series, Theater Bazaar. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. Across the old abandoned theater, a crazed woman named Enola is drawing in her apartment. She's drawing the theater's facade when it suddenly lights up. Driven by her curiosity, she enters the theater. Inside, the theater is dimly lit and messy. The host of the theater, who also happens to be a puppet, emerges from the rubble on stage. Enola takes her seat, and the host welcomes her. He then gestures to a large box on stage. Another puppet with a disfigured face emerges from the box. The lights suddenly turn off, and the show starts. American anthropologist Martin is in France with his girlfriend to study ancient French history. They are at a marketplace, when the girlfriend finds a pair of interesting-looking earrings. The old shopkeeper notices her interest and tells her to try them on. Martin notices that the earrings bear a symbol from the Necronomicon, an old book written by H.P. Lovecraft himself. A shopkeeper tells Martin that she has a copy of the Necronomicon and invites him to her home to discuss it in detail. Martin agrees. They buy the earrings and leave. On their way home, Martin tells his girlfriend to go to a spa while he visits the shopkeeper's house. The girlfriend is hesitant but gives in. Martin notices an eerie cross along the road and stops. They inspect the cross and find a creepy face carved into it. However, the girlfriend doesn't share Martin's interest and demands to go home immediately. Unbeknownst to them, they are being watched by something in the tall grass. Martin goes to the shopkeeper's house as planned. He enters and is offered some wine, which he humbly accepts to keep in with the local traditions. The shopkeeper brings out the Necronomicon, and Martin looks through it. He finds a strange and terrifying illustration of an amphibious creature called the Mother of Toads. He spends the rest of the day reading through the book. Night falls, and Martin gets ready to leave. The shopkeeper offers him another cup of wine, and he accepts it. However, he starts feeling woozy and decides to stay. He turns to the shopkeeper beside him, but now sees only an attractive blonde female due to the wine's powers. The shopkeeper, now in her younger form, removes her robe and kisses Martin. Meanwhile, the girlfriend gets anxious as Martin hasn't called her yet. She drives to the shopkeeper's house to pick her boyfriend up. She knocks on the door, but no one answers. She peeks through the window and is horrified to see her boyfriend playing a nasty hormone game with the shopkeeper. Martin is busy which are covered in a strange slime. Heartbroken, the girlfriend runs away and gets lost in the forest, which is filled with toads that suddenly try to chase her. She manages to return to her car and get inside. However, the windshield is covered with slime. She tries to wipe the slime down, but two monstrous hands emerge from behind and smother her to death. Morning arrives, and Martin wakes up to find a monstrous arm slung over his body. He quietly removes it and gets dressed. Beside him is the shopkeeper in her true form, revealing herself as the legendary mother of toads in the Necronomicon. He escapes the house, but gets lost in the forest until sundown. He returns to the shopkeeper's house and finds her standing outside, holding a bowl of smoky liquid with her creature-like hands. He calls her a freak and runs away, but ends up in the forest of toads just like his girlfriend. He later finds the car and his dead girlfriend's body inside, mutilated by toads. The mother of toads appears, and Martin kneels down in front of her, unable to resist. She opens her mouth wide, unsure whether to kiss or eat him. The film ends, and we return to the theater. The host gestures to a prop bathtub on stage, from which another puppet emerges and throws confetti. The show continues. This time, a middle-aged man named Axel wakes up in a bathroom covered with blood. He sees a cut on his hand, but doesn't remember what happened. He tries to call his wife Mona, but she isn't picking up. He even calls his friend for help, but to no avail. In a car just outside the building, Mona and her husband's friend are sitting together. They are in an affair that Axel doesn't yet know about. Mona goes up to the apartment to finally break up with her husband. Axel gets angry because she hasn't been answering her phone. But Mona reminds him that she went to visit her cousins. She then grabs a suitcase and starts packing her things. The two continue arguing, and Axel locks the door so that Mona can't leave. He confesses that he's been following her around, so he knows that Mona wasn't at her cousin's place. Mona brings out her phone, but Axel quickly grabs it and throws it away. Furious, Mona tells Axel that he's too suffocating and that she's going to leave him. Axel calms down and tries to convince her to stay. He kisses her, and Mona forcibly kisses him back. They end up playing a fast hormone game. Two minutes later, they finish, and Mona decides to tell Axel everything in the living room. While Axel waits for his wife to get dressed, he remembers the time when they confessed their love to each other. Mona is happy and smiling, but Axel mistakes her smile as flirting with the guy that just passed by, a sign of his obsessive and suffocating tendencies. The two talk in the living room. Mona confesses that she lied and is cheating on Axel. This has happened many times before. She tells Axel that she's in love with her lover and that she can't tell Axel because she's scared of his reaction. She is afraid that Axel might threaten to kill himself and guilt trip her into staying with him. 
She then reveals how she got pregnant and aborted a baby before, then trying to pass it off as a simple uterine infection. She also admits that she had sex with her sister's husband. She tells Axel that she hates everything about him. The conversation ends, and Mona continues packing. Axel tries to stop her, by telling her that he's been diagnosed with a disease. But Mona doesn't fall for it. Her phone rings, and Axel picks it up. He recognizes the voice as his friend's, and realizes that he's Mona's new lover. The friend later picks Mona up from the apartment, and they leave. Axel watches from the window as Mona and the friend drive away. In the blink of an eye, he is back to the bathroom floor, with a cut on his hand. He looks around the bathroom, and finds his friend's dead body in the shower. Confused, he runs out of the bathroom, and sees Mona packing up her things. However, he also finds Mona's dead body on the bed. It turns out that Mona packing her things is just an illusion caused by his own delusion. He tells the illusion that this is his friend's fault. Axel mistakenly thinks that his friend got angry at Mona, because she decided to stay with him, which was not the case. Axel finds a bloody knife on the bed, and holds it in his hand. The blade matches perfectly with the cut on his hand, revealing that it was him that killed them both. Suddenly, Axel gets an epiphany. He slits his own throat with a knife. This way, he can follow Mona into the afterlife. While his blood runs out, he repeatedly tells Mona's corpse, I love you. The film ends, and the host returns to the stage. However, he appears to be less puppet and more human. He opens his eyes and laughs creepily. A cabinet opens on the stage, and a couple in wedding attire, both puppets, walk out of the cabinet. The woman raises a machete and mimics stabbing her partner, but she stops. The lights turn off, and another film starts. A half-naked woman is running through a dark house, while Donnie playfully chases after her to the bedroom. They get naked, but huge pincers emerge from the woman's privates and cut Donnie's hot sausage off. He wakes up from the nightmare, and accidentally hits his wife's nose. She later prepares Donnie's breakfast. However, he sees his severed bloody but still hot sausage on the plate and freaks out. The scene ends, and Donnie opens his eyes, revealing him to be inside an office, consulting his therapist. He tells the therapist that this is what he saw in his nightmares for the past few nights. He glances at the photo of the therapist and his wife on the shelf. The wife is the woman with the monster vagina, but Donnie keeps this a secret. The therapist tells Donnie that dreams are a release that shows unconscious solutions to real-life problems. Nevertheless, he tells Donnie that to stop his dreams, he should count down from three and close his eyes. He tries this and wakes up, revealing the consultation to be just a dream. Donnie wakes up, tied to a table. His wife and a masked man show up. The wife presses a button on a remote, playing a recording of their wedding dance and a clip of Donnie abusing her. Another clip shows the wife cutting herself across the arm. On another table beside him is his mistress tied up. The wife turns a machine on, which rips the mistress' limbs from her body. The therapist suddenly appears and reminds him of his wedding vows, till death do us part. A circular saw suddenly emerges from the table and approaches Donnie's crotch. Donnie realizes that this is only a dream. He counts down from three and closes his eyes, and the dream ends. He wakes up, only to find that his arms are tied once more. The saw returns as well, and cuts Donnie in half. This scene is also a dream, not Donnie's, but his wife's. She smiles, happy that her abusive husband got what he deserved in her dream. She then grabs a syringe and sedates Donnie to prepare him for a secret operation. The following day, the therapist shows up at Donnie's house. It's revealed that he's the real-life lover of Donnie's wife. Suddenly, a loud groan is heard from upstairs. The therapist tells Donnie's wife to remember to feed it. The wife goes up to the attic, where Donnie is shown to be held captive. She probes Donnie's privates. Donnie notices a glass jar, with his severed sausage inside of it beside the TV. This is why the wife sedated Donnie earlier to knock him out, so that she can cut off his sausage when it's cooled down and in peace. She removes Donnie's gag and gives him water. He suddenly laughs maniacally, and tells his wife that he will kill her when he wakes up from his dream. He counts down from three, but surprisingly, before he can close his eyes, the wife cuts his eyelids off, leaving him unable to close his eyes. As a result, Donnie is left trapped in his own terrifying dreams. The film ends, and the host appears again, almost completely human this time. Meanwhile, Enola starts feeling strange, as if something's wrong with her. A box bursts open on stage, revealing a puppet sitting on a rocking deer toy. Then another film starts. A woman is driving through the forest with her daughter. The daughter plays with her doll. An old man on a motorcycle passes them by. Shortly after, another motorcyclist, the one much younger than the first, appears at the scene. He says hi to the daughter through the window and drives past them. A short while later, they find the two motorcyclists stopped on the road. The younger guy has been in an accident, while the older one sits on the side in a trance. The mother exits the car and calls for help. The daughter too leaves the car and notices a dying deer on the road. Apparently, the younger guy hit the deer and crashed. The old man notices the deer suffering and brings out a switchblade. He walks over to the deer and puts it out of its misery, while the daughter watches silently. 
Later that night, as the mother tucks her daughter into bed, the daughter asks her why people die. She says that people die to make room for other people. When asked if people die because they do bad things, the mother says that it doesn't happen. The mother admits that she doesn't know why people die. All she knows is that people should take care of other people when they're alive, so that when they die, they can die happily or live happily ever after. The film ends. The host catches a fly out of the air and squishes it in his hands. At this point, Enola is shaken and on the verge of tears. The host laughs maniacally and walks out off the stage. The spotlight shines on another box on the stage. An old woman puppet is inside, tearing up a newspaper. Then another film starts. A hooded stranger appears before a drunk addict and forces the addict down. The stranger brings out a syringe and jams it into the addict's eyeball. She then stabs a metal stake into the addict's heart. Right before the addict dies, the stranger gathers some eye fluid from the addict using the injection and injects it into her own eye. She's suddenly assailed by visions of the addict's core memories, which she proceeds to record in a journal. The stranger believes that doing this can give those broken women a voice. Their experiences will be preserved through her journals. One needs to simply collect a sample of their eye fluid, right as their life flashes before their eyes when they die. The stranger returns to her hideout, where she has stored hundreds of other dream-filled journals. She then cleans the blood from her clothes and puts some eye drops on her eye to relieve the pain. She does this the following night too. This time, her victim is an elderly woman sitting alone. She slashes the woman's throat and collects her eye fluid just like earlier. She hurries to jot down the woman's memories in her journal. One day, while out on the street, the stranger spots a pregnant woman. She stalks her into a corner. Curious about what fetuses think, feel, and see, the stranger decides to extract some fluid from the woman's belly. She collects a sample and leaves. That night, she contemplates injecting the fluid into her eye. She does anyway and recoils in pain. She throws up on the floor. Then a voice in her head tells her that the unborn have no eyes, therefore no memories. The voice tells her to stop messing with things that no human is supposed to know when they're alive. The voice drives the stranger crazy and forces her to carve out her own eyes. A few weeks later, the stranger walks down the street with a cane. She's blind now, but relieved at no longer having to know everything all the time. She cannot see, therefore cannot dream. The film ends. Enola suddenly turns stiff like a puppet. Meanwhile, the theater host has almost turned fully human. His face is smooth and no longer cracked. He reveals the entire cast of puppets so far. A spotlight is shined on Enola, revealing her eyes to be like the puppet eyes that the host had on just earlier. The lights turn off one last time for the final film. The girl is breaking up with her boyfriend, Greg. They are food fetishists, and the room is littered with eaten and uneaten food. Greg tries to convince his girlfriend to stay while gorging himself on food. A flashback plays, showing the girl whipping cream on Greg's lips, only to lick it up herself. She admits that she's been cheating on Greg. Greg gets angry because the girl herself demanded that they be an exclusive couple, only for her to cheat on him later on. Another flashback. This time, the couple is in a candy store, feeding each other candies. She tells Greg that she isn't ready for a serious relationship. This is despite the fact that she forced Greg to commit to her. Another flashback plays. In this one, the couple is sitting on the hood of a car. She lovingly feeds Greg some pie. Greg leans in for a kiss, but she playfully forces his face down into the pie. They laugh together. Finally, she tells Greg that she loves him, but only as a friend. Another flashback. Greg is in a bathtub filled with cream and fruits while the girl straddles him. She hand feeds him fruits and then brings out a large funnel, which she uses to stuff cream down Greg's mouth. Greg is in shambles. He throws up on the floor, but grabs the bits and pieces from his puke and eats them. One last flashback. The couple is enjoying a picnic under a beautiful sunset. She fastens a nebulizer mask onto Greg's face and submerges the tube in a bowl full of red-colored liquid. Greg inhales and drinks all of it. Despite the girlfriend telling Greg to stay away from her, Greg crawls toward her. She finally agrees to give Greg another chance and tells him that she will see him later. Later that day, the girlfriend heads to an underground food fetishist party with her friend. They are welcomed by the hostess, who tells them to enjoy themselves. They enter the venue, where the other visitors are already busy eating lavishly. They sit down and are handed plate upon plate. She eats only bits of bread, while her friend wolfs down various foods. A few feet away from them, a woman spits up her food all over her companion. She picks up the mess with a cookie and even disgustingly eats the cookie. Shortly after, Greg is paraded into the room, followed by chefs. The chefs cut his ankles, bringing him down to his knees. The hostess appears with a butcher's knife. Greg sees his girlfriend and asks her what is happening. She apologizes, kisses him, and then leaves. The hostess cuts Greg's head clean off. Greg's body is disrobed and hung before getting its insides ripped out. The visitors all feast on his body, which the girlfriend herself has fattened up for this very moment. She grabs his heart for herself. She squeezes all the blood out of it and then proceeds to take a bite. 
The visitors all sit down at a long table with the girlfriend in the middle, holding Greg's head on a plate. The film ends, and the theater host returns, now fully human. He walks over to Enola, who has now turned completely into a puppet. He drags her body to the stage, throws her into an ornate box, and places a flower upon her body. Just before he shuts the box's lid, the woman opens her eye and sees her last view, before she turns into the host's theater puppet. This is Daniel's CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.